Car Talk. Hi, right, welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. We'll talk about the real Nelson Mandela. Mandela at the bottom of this hour. A couple things I want to address in this segment. And again, I, I want to reiterate, I want to encourage you to think about participating in the Christmas Critter Campaign 2013. Uh, you can go to AFR.net. You can see the catalog. You can call 877-907-GOAT and be able to order up a gift. Again, 100% of what you give goes directly to the mission field to purchase the gift that you have chosen. And let me give you just a a quick uh, example of the range. So there's something that almost everybody will be able to afford. For instance, you can buy a pair of chickens for 11 bucks. Now, if you get a pair of them, uh, they can produce two to 300 eggs a year. So that's food to eat. Uh, They can reproduce. They can produce chicks, which in turn you can sell. Uh, The eggs can be sold. So it provides an opportunity for people to begin to provide for themselves. And you can go all the way up to a water buffalo for 460 bucks. A water buffalo is like the John Deere tractor uh, of Asia. So they can use it for transportation. They can use it for pulling a plow. They can use it for providing milk. So this is an animal that will bless the family immensely and enable a man maybe to become an independent self Sustaining farmers. You can go from 11 bucks for a pair of chickens all the way up to a water buffalo for 460 bucks, the John Deere tractor of Asia. And you can even uh, provide an entire village with clean water through a Jesus well. That's a thousand bucks, but that will provide an entire village with clean, fresh water. Uh, these wells are located near churches or Bible colleges, so, a great opportunity for missionaries and pastors to reach out and share the love of Jesus. That's a huge problem in the third world is is water that is not safe for cooking and not safe for drinking. You can do you can take care of that for an entire village. What a tremendous gift that would be. So more of that as the week progresses, but I encourage you to do that. 877-907-GOAT, or you can go to AFR.net. Now, Saturday, as you are aware, was the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. That's the anniversary of Pearl Harbor Day. And by the way, Barack Obama, do you know how Barack Obama celebrated or commemorated Pearl Harbor with a picture of himself? I mean, I, I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there is something, and, and I am being very deliberate when I say this, and I'm not the first to say this, But there is something pathologically narcissistic about this man. I mean, it's disturbing just how self-focused President Obama is. Remember when he wanted to commemorate the 58th anniversary of Rosa uh, Parks, uh, sitting, refusing to give up her seat on the bus? He didn't show a picture of Rosa Parks. He showed a picture of himself sitting where Rosa Parks sat. Now, on Pearl Harbor Day... Uh, He didn't, the picture he showed was of him at the USS Arizona Memorial. So everything with President Obama is about him. It is, to me, it's frankly exceptionally uh, disturbing. But so anyway, that's how he uh, celebrated Pearl Harbor Day. And by the way, I came across a piece today talking about the leading causes of premature death, like of 1.7 billion years of potential human life are forfeited every year to early death. In other words, if people were healthy and they weren't subject to this and that and the other thing and lived a normal life, they would live out 1.7 billion more life years uh, every year. So this um, interactive atlas listed in kind of a chart form the, the leading causes of premature uh, death in the world. And the interesting thing, and this gets uh, sets me up to talk about Pearl Harbor you ask most people, you would think that the leading cause of death would be war. Most people would say that. Well, war cures more, kills more people than anything. But worldwide, war casualties account for just 0.05% of the total life years that are lost annually, lost every year. That's less than, that's less than half of one-tenth of 1%. 
So war actually is responsible for an extremely small number of the loss of life years every year. It's interesting that one of the major causes of untimely death is malaria. And malaria is entirely preventable. DDT will knock down the mosquitoes that carry malaria, knock them dead, knock them flat. We had malaria on the run. This is responsible for maybe 2 million infant deaths every year, and it's curable. DDT is absolutely harmless. It, it, it was made into this environmental demon, but it's not. It's harmless. In fact, one guy that defended DDT, I've told you this story before, he was a professor, science guy, and he would have debates all over the country with somebody that was saying we got to get rid of DDT, we got to ban DDT and all that. This guy would actually take a teaspoon of DDT, and he would drink it before the debate started. He'd get in front of the debate audience right on the platform, get out a spoonful, pour some DDT in it, and, and drink it right down just like cough syrup. Did it every time. And it was his way of illustrating that, look, this is harmless. All this exaggerated bloviation about what it does to bird eggs and all that's just totally hyped, totally made-believe, totally made up. And malaria... I'm getting way off track here, but malaria knocks down the mosquitoes that kill 2 million infant children every single year, and yet for no good reason it has been banned. And to me, I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there's no compassion in that. If you ask me, I mean, the liberals are the ones that always talk about how compassionate they are and how much they care about people and how much they care about children and how much we don't, how much we conservatives don't. Well, I'm telling you, there is no compassion in prohibiting a product that could save 2 million infant lives every single solitary year. Anyway, I don't know how I got off on that. That was uh, war casualties every year, very small percentage of the number of people that die. 0.05% of all life years that are lost every year are lost due to war. But Saturday was the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And, of course, what brought World War II to an end, or what brought Japan, well, really brought World War II to an end because Germany had already surrendered, was the dropping of the nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's what prompted Japan to finally capitulate, finally surrender, and it led to the Allied victory in the Pacific Theater. Now, these were terrible tragedies, and, and nothing I say should be taken to minimize the toll of human suffering and death and tragedy that took place in both of those cities. Dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, didn't work, they didn't surrender, had to drop another bomb on Nagasaki about a week later, uh, and that got their attention. They said, look, these people are serious. We lost 240,000 Japanese in these two bombings, and they finally surrendered. They finally uh, capitulated. And so there has been, you know, you even look at, at textbooks today in this Common Core curriculum and others, what our, our school children are taught is that America is to blame for that, that this shows that America is an evil, rotten, colonial, rapacious, murdering empire. Because we just dropped a bomb on 240,000 civilians. What a terrible, evil, malicious nation the United States is. Now, my point, I've got a column up at rightlyconcerned.com. My, uh, the point of my column, very simply, is that Japan is to blame for Hiroshima. The United States is not to blame for Hiroshima. If there was no Pearl Harbor, there would have been no Hiroshima. If there was no Pearl Harbor there would have been no Nagasaki. In other words, Pearl Harbor attack was unprovoked, uh, resulted in 2,388 American lives being lost that day, December 7, 1941, a date that will live in infamy. And we have a, an inalienable right as a nation, just as people do. One of the unalienable rights that a nation has is the right to defend itself against an unprovoked attack. That's what makes it a just war. We have the right of self-defense as a nation just as much as American individuals do. And that's what our declaration of war against Japan and eventually the Axis powers was all about. We were engaged in a war of self-defense because Japan was determined to defeat us and to conquer us and to annihilate us. I've been to sites in Oregon. You can go there where the Japanese actually dropped bombs on American soil. They've got little plaques there in the ground that you can visit. They sent these balloons over with these bombs on them, and they dropped wherever they landed on the mainland. So they definitely had designs against the American people. And we have every single moral right to defend ourselves. And 
in the, the ultimate act of self-defense was to drop these bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, the reason I believe this is morally justified is because of the lives that were saved because we dropped these two bombs, fat man and uh, little boy. The alternative to dropping these two bombs was a costly and bloody invasion of Japan itself. Now, we had all this experience taking these islands in the Pacific. And the Japanese demonstrated time and time again, even in these tiny little islands, they would fight to the death. They would not surrender. They would not retreat. The death toll in the Japanese army in a lot of these small islands between 90 and 100 percent. They just refused to surrender. And so we were taking one island after another, pushing them back to Japan, and it became evident that if we were going to fight this war conventionally, we would have to send uh, untold American troops to invade Japan, and we were going up against an enemy, both military and civilian, that would not surrender. They would do whatever was in their power. They would fight with the last ounce of breath in their bodies. They were going to have to be exterminated before they would surrender. So Harry Truman, Winston Churchill did the same thing. They calculated, in fact, the last uh, Japanese soldier didn't come out of the jungle and surrender until 1974. Maybe you heard about that. Guy had been hiding out in the jungles of the Philippines, didn't surrender his sword until he was ordered to do so by a commanding officer in 1974. That gives you an idea of just the determination and the ferocity of the uh, Japanese people. So if we invaded, they were going to take as many of us down to Shio as they possibly could. So Truman and Churchill both estimated that the bombs saved the lives of about 1 million American soldiers and 500,000 British soldiers. So the fact that we dropped these bombs meant that there were a million soldiers, men who received the gift of life. What was preserved for them was the prospect of building marriages and families and careers after the war was over. So the bombs, as terrible as they were, preserved a future for countless American men and brought husbands home to their wives and fathers home to their children. Now, my dad was one of those. He was a medic. Uh, he was headed to Japan when the war ended. Uh, medic served right at the front line, so my father was exposed to danger in all of his service. He could have been a casualty, and I may never have had the opportunity to enjoy the life that I have had. So a million and a half allied lives were saved, but also millions and millions of Japanese lives. Don't forget this. The slogan from the Japanese was 100 million subjects of the Japanese Empire will die for the emperor and nation. Those 100 million Japanese were preserved because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Morally justified, fought with Japan. Coming January 23rd through the